Well, let me do this. Um, and we can have more people join us here in a little bit. Um, but let me go ahead, open us in prayer, and then we, we will dive in and um, just have a great evening with one another. Um, so let me pray. Our gracious name, Father, God, we just come to you. We thank you so much for this day. Thank you for all that you do. Lord, I, I lift up uh, everyone here and just pray that you bless uh, ministries. Uh, just uh, help us as we are trying to be effective in reaching uh, families uh, with disabilities. Help us to, to just see how we can best do this. And God, I just pray now that you use our time wisely. Help us to try to talk through how to relaunch ministry, how to uh, do that, and just whatever's going on uh, in our, our churches, God. Just pray that you help us be able to learn from one another, build on from one another, and uh, just bless our time together now. Just pray this all in your great and holy name. Amen. All right. Well, want to welcome everyone um, to come and, and uh, uh, excited to get kicked back up. It's, it feels like it's been forever, but between, uh, I went back and looked, it's been three months since we've been able to meet. Um, we didn't meet because of the conference back in October. That was the exact same time, so we didn't meet then. And then our day falls on Thanksgiving and Christmas. So we don't meet, we didn't meet those two times. Um, so it's, it's been long overdue. I, I miss our time together. So uh, three months, uh, four months since we really met. So it's it's good to be back together. Um, but let's just go around. Um, I'd like you to introduce yourself. Let us know who you are. Um, tell us where you're from, since we're from all over the country. And then uh, a little bit about your ministry. And then if there are any questions that you might have, let us know what those are. Um, and, and then we'll we'll be getting to those as, as we go. But uh, we'll just start off with that. So, um, Isabel, would you mind kicking us off? Oh, you're muted still. Hello. <laughs> Let's do that again. <laughs> Hi, my name is Isabel Smith, and I am from Texas. I'm from uh, Temple, Texas, but I work in Colleen, Texas at Grace Christian Center. And I recently was hired there. I am finishing out my first month uh, at the church, actually, but I have been... I grew up in the church, and so I have lots of experience in uh, children's ministry, and I have um, a small amount of experience in special needs ministry, um, and I'm really excited because the position that I was hired into um, will give me a chance to be over special needs. Uh, our special needs program at the church has room for lots of growth. Um, it sounds like it's been closed for a while because of COVID. Um, the children's ministry itself is still not even fully open, um, but they're in the process of getting ready to do that. Um, and so in addition to that, uh, we want to figure out how to move forward in our special needs department, um, because we understand that special needs families need help just as much as everybody else, and sometimes even more, <laughs> a lot of times even more from what I have uh, learned. And I'm just trying to grow uh, in my understanding of how to partner alongside families, help them know that they are cared for, that they are wanted, and that they're loved. Um, when, they, when people are in special needs families, it sounds like often they get overlooked. Um, and sometimes because kids are different, um, people just say, oh, that's too hard. I can't find a way to integrate them into my ministry. And I don't want that to happen. And that's the last thing that we want at our church. Um, and so I'm excited uh, to talk about that tonight, learn um, some good ways for how to open up a ministry. That is uh, the biggest thing, uh, just like, where do we start? <laughs> um, and yeah, I actually grew up in Seattle, Washington, just a little tidbit about myself. Um, I recently moved here a little over two years ago. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's great. I'm excited to see what God's going to do. Um, and it's really cool to be here with all of y'all because I've never been part of this before. So thanks for letting me join y'all. <laughs> oh, absolutely. We, we love having you. Hey, just real quick question, just so we can have an idea about how big is your church? How big is the church? Um, it depends. <laughs> it's a big yeah, I know we've got. So yeah. <laughs> Normally we have between three and 4,000 people. So it's a pretty big church. Um, that would be a normal Sunday. Yeah. Uh, however. <laughs> yep. 
Yeah, all, all bets are off right now for everybody. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Absolutely. All right, well, welcome. We're so glad to have you. Um, Diane, welcome, my friend. You bet, long time no talk to, huh? Right. <laughs> yeah, we just talked yesterday. Um, I'm Diane Dawson, I'm from Wichita, Kansas. Um, the church that I work at is New Spring and uh, just got the numbers uh, who were on campus last week and it was a little over 5,000. So after COVID, we'll probably be more than like 10,000. Right now I know of 55 kids who are in the um, special needs program and we are only supposed to serve uh, birth through eighth grade. However, there are some um, folks who were grandfathered in, if you will, uh, into the program. And when I came in a year ago, I uh, during the interview, I said I was not okay having a 17-year-old in with a two-year-old. And they said that would never be a problem. Well, I quickly found out that's what's going on. And so I am currently working on getting in a... Uh, high school to a young adult ministry. Um, the church I work for, wonderful, great people, but maybe not understanding um, the special needs of folks. And they're a little bit hesitant to go um, and offer a full uh, realm of services for, uh, they, we want to go small and we want to go slow. And then once we are successful, um, I'll probably want to build on some more, but um, I'm okay with starting on, uh, uh, you know, up to like 24, 25 year old uh, students or adults. And um, in our congregation, I, I see many folks uh, who have special needs. A lot of folks I see with Down syndrome. And it, it just kills me when I see them um, put headphones on and play video games and are sitting next to their folks in church. And that just bugs me. So um, right now I don't have a room, I don't have a place, but this is just gonna happen. We are gonna start it, don't know how, but it's gonna happen. And so I told Doc yesterday, I'm speaking into life. It's just gonna happen. So Amen. don't know, <laughs> but it's gonna happen. So um, yes, cause I have this young man that I just adore and he turns 18 October 6th and then we have no place for him. And, he's will have a place so um i'm a retired special ed teacher i am retired in may um then i started working for a few weeks uh, before the pandemic for the church and then we were closed until july so really worked from july on but um this was just a godsend for me because um i'm a passionate person in like liked to make things better. And I probably would drove my family crazy if I did not have an outlet to, um, to express myself and to love on people and love. So this is what I need. So it's a blessing for me and my family. <laughs> yeah. And your team and an adult, adults ministry is gonna happen. You have a great plan. Yeah, it's gonna. <laughs> Absolutely, love, love the attitude and the passion there, so that's awesome. All right, Quincy, uh, welcome, you're, you're muted. Hey guys, I'm Quincy. Um, I work at Abundant Life Church. Uh, it's a church in Lee Summit, Missouri. I live in Lee Summit, Missouri. And um, we have a special needs minister. I'm the special needs coordinator and we have a children's class, an adults class. We have a parent support group. Um, we shoot for four respites a year. This year is going to look, we're just going to have two just with the calendar and the way the things kind of shook out. But i um, trying to think. We have a couple of campuses. That's something I've been waiting. Um, when I first started, we launched I started about this time last year and we launched our first campus and then we're launching our next campus next weekend, Super Bowl Sunday. So not like this Sunday, but next Sunday. And then um, also a fourth campus is like in the pipeline. It's going to launch at the end of the year. So that's something that we've been waiting through recently. Um, I think that was about it. So. Yeah. 
Awesome. Well, love having you here, Quincy, and and you do you do great work and uh, as well. We love partnering with you, uh, Laura. Yeah, I am Laura. I'm with SOAR. I'm their activities director. Um, we're based out of Kansas City area, <laughs> Overland Park ish, we're now in Lenexa. Um, but yeah, so I oversee our, I started about this time last year also, actually, and I oversee our respite nights and our summer camp. Um, and obviously that's looked a little different this year, and we've learned just how to be creative, but it has like stretched us in really good ways that we would have never expected um, and helped, for example, our adults ministry to grow quite a bit through virtually. Um, so now we're just starting to look at how can we do respites again, but on a way smaller scale than before so that we're reaching more comfortable numbers with COVID um, and looking at doing our camp again this summer and just ready to get back in person. All right. Go ahead, Elizabeth. All right. Well, I'm Elizabeth. I'm um, from Atlanta originally, but now I'm in Kansas City. I also work for SOAR. I'm um, interning here. Um, and so I kind of help with all aspects of our ministry. Um, I work pretty closely with Laura and all of our events. Um, but the main reason that I'm at SOAR is to be able to help churches establish disability ministries. Um, and so I actually help um, with a couple churches throughout um, the week, one of which is Abundant Life and get to kind of see how they do ministries. Um, and so that's a really awesome opportunity. And so, yeah, that's me. And hopefully um, we'll be on staff with SOAR later on and do church consulting. So, yeah. She will be. I'm confident of that. So, again, yeah, I'm Doc Hensley. I'm the executive director and founder of SOAR and, and uh, uh, I don't know, done all kinds of different things, but um, been able to start up a couple of ministries and, and now have assisted over 380 churches and starting ministry or taking what they have and improving it throughout the United States, Canada, Brazil, and Jericho. So um, I'm passionate about helping churches. Um, and so, you know, tonight is, is just, um, you know, this is your time. We can learn from one another, talk through uh, what's going on um, and see how we're doing. So um, from the sounds of it, um, it sounds like everyone's pretty much back in person or, or somewhat in person, maybe not full-fledged like before, but at least have some in person or getting ready to launch. Is that right? Okay. All right. Um, so let me just kind of throw it out. What, anyone have any, you know, big question or hurdle or something that you're trying to figure out what to do that we can talk through as, as a group? Um, or something, or I, I can always come up with something, but um, I want, you know, my first thing is I want to try to meet our needs of those on the call. So, um, you know, what do you have? And that could be as well, if you got an individual, a student who you're having a hard time trying to keep, take care of. The one thing I just want to share is, you know, we are recording this just for help later. So don't use anyone's names um, with that, um, uh, with it, but, um, you know, you can say scenarios, say ages, and so on and so forth with that. So with that, anyone have any specific concerns or issues that they'd like to talk about with the group? So and you I'll can all just jump in. <laughs> yeah. Um, so like I said earlier, I am brand new to the church that I'm working at, and they used to have a pretty strong and thriving uh, special needs department. They have uh, classrooms that are set aside for special needs uh, students and adults. Um, however, things have fizzled out. And so a lot of special needs families in our church uh, have become super disconnected. So my question to you is, how would you suggest that I begin to make those connections again? Um, because I'm brand new. and <laughs> I'm trying to get to know people and uh, find my way in there um, so that they can feel comfortable and safe um, and want to go to church. And so obviously I need to prepare things in the classroom, but um, in regards to socially getting connected to them, what are your suggestions? I, I would suggest a lot of phone calls um, and going through the whole contact list and calling all of them and following back up if they don't answer and just really 
going after them and showing that you care and you want them there. That's the number one thing that I would suggest. And, and I say that for everybody. So yeah, go ahead, Diane. A lot of times I will email them first because um, they might not accept a phone number that they don't know. And so I tell them that you're getting this, you're gonna be getting a phone call and then I follow it up you know, a couple days later or whatever, or I might even say, I, I wanna call you and if there's a time better than another for me to call, but I usually start with an email because I have more success than a, just a blind phone call. Yeah. Um, on, on the phone calls, a couple things I've learned in the past and our team has learned. And then some things I've learned talking with families um, as well. Uh, to pass on and, and make sure we're, we're all on board with. Um, so one great idea there, Diane, um, I've never thought about emailing ahead of time. I like that because um, you're, you're absolutely right. A lot of people won't take your call there. So you leave lots of messages. Um, first thing, if you ever leave a message, please follow back up. Realize families probably aren't going to call you back. Um, and, and so um, this is hard to say, but it's just the hard facts. The reason the families don't call you back is because they don't think you really care. Um, and that's, that's just the hard truth. Um, and it's because they don't know you real well and don't know much about it. And they, they think, honestly, you're just checking a box. Oh, they have to call me and go on. And it's not until, you know, and then therefore when you do call, really find out how they're doing, ask questions. And then the thing I love to do whenever I'm talking to a parent on the phone, before I hang up with them, I say, hey, how can I be praying for you and your family? And, you know, then they realize, oh, wow, this is cool. And then I stop and I pray for them right then and there. That's just pure gold. And, and again, you're creating this, this amazing bond with them. So that's the number one thing that you have to do. Um, do it with the volunteers as well. Find the volunteers that you've got in your ministry and do that um, and, and go through that and welcome them and say, hey, you know, we're trying to get things launched back up. I'm new. Um, what's your story? Why are you, why were you involved? Um, what made you so excited to do it? And try to find out who they are, what makes them tick? Uh, what are they excited about? Um, and then from that, you can start seeing who you can get, especially for you, Isabel, right now. Um, and, and Diane, this is going to go for you as well. Um, being, you know, fairly new, both of you are pretty new in your roles. Um, you're going to need to build a team around you. You can't do this by yourself. And so you want to build this team around you and find some amazing volunteers who will step up and maybe have some leadership qualities. And so you want to, as you're talking to these volunteers, finding out what makes them tick, why they're passionate, why are they doing what they're doing. And so just kind of keeping that in mind uh, of people who might be a good thing and pray over them. And then at the same time with them, find out what their prayer requests are and then pray for them at the same time. So important things, especially during this time with COVID, when we've had so much isolation, um, it's great to do. And, and I try to do it, um, you know, it depends on the size of your ministry, um, but if you could go through and try, maybe try to contact them at least every other month, I think that would be pretty cool. Um, if you could do that, that would be a great thing. Just can't touch in. Now, coming back, launching, um, like, you know, we've all said, we all have families who just aren't ready to come back to church yet. Um, and so the important thing, and, and here's a shift I think we all need to make in ministry. Um, and that is everything that we do from here on out is going to be different from anything that's ever been done in the past. Just admit and realize we're never going back to how it was. We just aren't. We have a new normal and, and actually we need to change things. Um, because we've got better. We've learned so much in the last nine months by, you know, all these churches becoming virtual. All of a sudden, we're reaching families who we never were able to reach before. And so the worst thing we could ever do 
is go back in person and shut off the virtual. So what I encourage everyone is to become hybrid. And so, you know, one of the things I always say is we need to replicate ourselves. Um, you know, replicate yourself in, in every way. And it's really important for someone like Quincy right now, who's got all these new campuses opening up. She's going to need leaders if they're doing disability ministry there, because you can't be at all the campus. So if you're replicating yourself, those are the first people you're able to step into in these new campuses. But it also helps you when other things step up. Well, you can recruit a volunteer uh, to be your online director um, who would handle all the online programming um, and figure out what that is. You can do it through Zoom. There's different things you can do. Um, no, it's not going to be the same, but we got to find ways to, to help them through that. Maybe you do have some science school classes and you know maybe you go ahead and just turn on um, a Zoom live and or Facebook live where you can have them be a part of that and interact. Um, uh, with it. So there's all different ways you can do it, but you get, again, find what's right for you, find what's right for your class and, and your families. Um, but that's going to be an important thing that we have to figure out as we move forward now, is how can we reach our families who aren't ready to come back? Because that's the other thing. So many of our families, especially in our, you know, disability and special needs ministries, they're just not ready to come back yet. Um, they want to wait, you know, they're higher risk individuals, so they're going to wait to make sure, and that may be several months. It may even be a year um, for some of them. So we've got to be able to minister to them and meet their needs um, while we're doing that. Other thoughts that anyone has or questions with what I've thrown out there so far? Doc, do you know of any churches or um, ministries that have tried a hybrid or a virtual option for their Sunday morning services? And yeah, would you just mind sharing a little bit more about that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Quincy. Um, so there's a, a, a couple different things that you can do. Um, I know Grace is trying to do a, a hybrid model right now and try to figure that out. Um, and, and a couple other churches are too that I've, I've talked to. What some of them are doing, there, there's a couple different ways. Um, one church um, that I know they actually have, um, they've gotten a, a, an iPad that they're able to take into the, you know, if they have a, a standalone classroom, um, they've got an iPad then that they are using for Zoom. And they'll open that up, they'll invite all their families to participate. And then they've got it there in the room and they're, they're actually able to kind of participate and be part of the lesson. Um, and, you know, they really do a hard, they, they have some specific individuals who will man that, constantly be moving the iPad around so everyone can see them. The teacher, you know, instructor would be calling on people on the iPad as well so that they can interact. You'll talk to them as well. So, you know, trying to make it as a, a bigger class. Um, there are others who um, they may record their class as they're doing it. Um, or maybe they'll, they'll record their, you know, maybe they have an interactive class um, where everyone, integrated class, um, and they may record some of that, and then they, they just share that through the week um, with it. So there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, you may not be able to have things live, and that's okay, um, but it's just trying to find something for the families to keep them connected and keep them, you know, be able to be interactive there. Um, to, to the best of your ability. But those are some of the things that a lot are doing. Um, I know, you know, a couple others, you know, are using, um, you know, maybe some digital curriculum that they're able to do. And then they're actually having a, a Zoom class online for anyone who's there. And I've talked to a church who, who's done that, where they actually have the entire Zoom class, everyone comes on, and then they're teaching everything via Zoom. So, you know, they may have, you um, you know, their regular class going on, and then they've got their virtual director can do one, their virtual class at the same time. So it's kind of going on together, and then they feel like they're having their own class. So those are a couple of things that I've, I've heard um, with it. But again, it's, it's finding what's right for you guys. And it also depends on technology that your church has um, with it too, and age groups and 
and everything else too. But we also know it's not right for everybody. You know, you're not gonna be able to meet the needs of every single one of your individuals. And so that's the first thing that you just have to agree to accept. And it, I have a hard time, our team's been working on that. We've created virtual respites and that was one of the hardest thing. You know, it, virtual respites just aren't the best for really profound and, you know, low functioning individuals. Um, they just don't work well. And it would be the same with any of the virtual models. There, I don't have good answers for how to get around that yet. Um, and so those are something that we need to still kind of try to brainstorm. And, and they're just loving on those families, um, contacting them and, and seeing how we may, might be able to help them out other ways. Um, but, you know, it's trying to figure out the best way that we can meet their needs as we go. Does that help there, Quincy? Okay. Other thoughts or questions anyone has? Um, I'm going to ask a question. Uh, my older class, uh, I think the youngest child is sixth grade and the oldest child is going to be 18. But anyway, um, the leader in that class is dynamic and wonderful. And she, before she led the class, she had... Uh, was real downtrodden and real, didn't talk to anybody, but she's just this new bubbly person. And anyway, her daughter is in the class and her daughter is um, pretty um, severe intellectually, um, pretty, pretty low. Um, and she does a lot of attention seeking behaviors because uh, mom gives attention to, every, to other folks and um, I've written a social story for, which is helping some. And then um, I, I've never really used a lot of power cards. Um, I have a lot of visuals for her and um, trying to give her praise, uh, just different time, random times. Uh, mom does not want to teach the other class. She wants to teach the class she's teaching. And it's really doing mom a good job. I mean, mom, mom is just blossoming. Um, but the young girl, um, her attention seeking behaviors may be hitting and foul language uh, we ignore. We, and um, only doing positive for positive uh, attention and because it is attention seeking behavior. Sure. But any ideas? Um, so is, is the mom just wanting to teach that class because it's the class that her daughter's in? Is that, am I understanding that correctly? Not necessarily. It's just um, mom is so successful with the kids. When a stranger will come in and the stranger will say, wow, these kids are getting it. And that's not the way it was a year ago when other people were teaching it. Mom is phenomenal. Mom, mom's great. And so she's getting so much success and it's so good. It's just not because of her daughter. She's just doing an awesome job. Yeah. How, how old's the daughter again, roughly? 16. 16, okay. And the age group of this class? Uh, sixth grade through high school. Okay. And there's only one of like the sixth grade through high school classes right now. Oh yeah. yeah. Um, I have a hard time getting a room and we are, we're in a room that's closed off of the nursery for this one. It that will not be my adults though, but yeah, it, no, I can't find another room. Yeah. So, you know, maybe looking ahead, maybe offering her the chance to be in the adult to see if it might be with, because the increased behavior is because mom's there. Um, and she's needing, trying to get mom's attention um, with that. And we see that a lot with some of the kids who, you know, do that. Um, you know, and then, you know, I'd, I'd say, you know, trying to, just trying to find out other ways you can distract and do different things with her. Um, you know, uh, you know, may, maybe, you know, I, I would find out I do a couple things, Diane. One, I talk to mom and, and see, hey, what really excites her, 
her, what motivates her, and then find that. Maybe she likes to color. Um, so, you know, you can do that. And if she doesn't like that, you know, maybe, you know, whatever it is, you can find out what she likes to do and see if that's something you can work into the class environment. Um, I don't know if you know any of that yet. Yeah, it's McDonald's. She wants to go to McDonald's and she likes to swim. And that's about it. I have another classroom with my younger guys and uh, the mom even wants her daughter to go there. And I'm saying no, um, that this is her age and we're not gonna put someone who, who says some naughty words in with my younger guys. That's not okay. No. That's not an answer. No. Right, I agree. Um, you know, and, and maybe what you could do is you know, get pictures of swimming, swimming and swimmers and that. Get pictures of McDonald's um, and, and where she can look at those and like that. And, and sometimes that might be able to help. Yeah, I haven't done that. Yeah. Uh, and, and help with that. Um, and, you know, great idea with doing the social stories and that. Um, but, you know, you can and talk to mom, obviously, and see, well, you know, look, if you keep doing well, one of these might be one of, might become a reward for you, but we have to be quiet. We have to stay here and be good. Um, and so just try and encourage that. But sometimes just by seeing the pictures of those would, would help. So, um, and, and I would take, I, what I would do is I'd find out what her favorite McDonald's is. And I'd go take pictures of that McDonald's, um, not just take, get McDonald's off the, you know, the web or something. And then swimmers or, or that you can get from all over, but just different things where maybe that might be something just kind of help, help her, you know, calm down with it. Um, and then, you know, just kind of talking through that, um, you know, it's, it's also um, maybe talking with mom and, and see, you know, if she knows her child's love language, what is her love language? Um, and, you know, is, is she, a physical touch. Does she like to be touched? Um, you know, do, is it words of affirmation? Is it, you know, what is it? Um, and you might be able to work some of that in. Um, you know, if it is touch, well, you know, maybe just, you know, doing a ma shoulder massage, um, deep massage to kind of help it's, her. It's dance party. And it's so we've changed the schedule. So we do like our prayer journal song. Um, Bible, uh, our Bible story song. And then, so we're trying to do dance parties with it. Yeah. So, you know, and, and I think you're doing a great job trying to have her be interactive um, in there. And so I, I just try to brainstorm and try to figure out some of the other things, um, you know, and I'm sure you've already done this, Diane, but I say, you know, again, talk to mom and see, does she have other ideas? What works well at home? Um, to stop it, um, you, know, you know, to stop the language, you know, quiet mouth, you know, what, what, you know, does any, anything like that help, um, or, you know, what, what might be there, so that can be helpful, um, and then, like I said, once you get the adult class, maybe, you know, bumping her up um, instead yes. of down yes. would be helpful, and I think, I think that might help decrease it, because, most likely in that situation, she's trying to get the attention, especially from mom. Um, and why? I agree. So, I agree. So as soon as that happens, she's she's right. going to the other class, right. and uh, mom can well, still teach her thing. And, right. and mom's and great. And, I'd say that you need to really emphasize with mom, and it can be so hard. I can just imagine emphasize with mom that no matter what her daughter does, no matter how how much she acts out, mom cannot react to it and cannot say anything. Um, it has to be whoever her buddy is that's doing it or somebody else. Yeah, um, that's not that's not happening. Yeah, so no, mom so, can't. So that's where you need to have a real serious conversation with mom saying, look, I, I know this is really hard, but this this will help out. And what's going to happen, I guarantee you, it's going to get a whole lot worse for one or two Sundays, but then it gets better. It does. And I've seen that happen. So because all, all mom is doing every time she'll say something to her, it's reinforced that. And so if, if we can try to break that 
and help mom understand that, oh, that can become so much better, but it's hard. It's really hard. Um, and I also know I might put Quincy on the spot here a little bit, but she has a lot of her, a lot of her individuals, um, parents actually serve within the ministry too. So I'm not sure if you've had to have any conversations like that um, or not. I can't think of anything off the top of my head, uh, specifically some of my parents, sometimes it helps. I don't know, just because they see it all the time and they're like, oh yeah, that's my child. Like they don't really get too upset. But um, something I thought of, and you wanna be careful not to reward the negative behaviors, but sometimes the kid, the um, individuals who are seeking attention, if I can give them a leadership job or a role, sorry if this was already mentioned, um, but um, some kind of job, like if she's wanting attention from her peers or if it's specifically her mom's attention, maybe she can be teacher assistant of some kind where she can still get a lot of positive attention by doing something that contributes to the class. Um, maybe she's the door greeter and she greets, if mom's there early and she greets all the students as they come in or she passes out the paper. I'm sure you're trying that stuff too, but that's just something that worked sometimes for kids who are seeking attention. And it, that class is so funny. I mean, those guys will throw elbows to be the line leader or to um, turn over uh, the the visual schedule. They Those guys, they're adorable. They're, they're competitive and they're on it. And like, I know this stuff. And I mean, they're throwing elbows to get to be the first one. So um, we do have assigned, I, I've assigned things so we don't throw elbows. But um, so, but we're trying that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I, I, I like what Quincy said there. If you can find something that she can do every week and that's her job, um, maybe it's, you know, giving everyone a, you know, a, a marker or giving them the paper or, you know, if you have a Bible that they all use, passing out the Bibles, um, whatever it might be, um, you know, something that's easy, but, you know, she can kind of feel in charge there then um, with that, that can be helpful um, for it. But it's, it's being patient um, and working through that. Um, but no, with whenever you got someone with behavior like this, um, when you ignore it, it will always get worse. But that's what has to happen in order for it to stop. Um, and I have gone through some ugly Sundays, ugly Sundays. Um, but then, you know what? I, in fact, I've got one guy I can remember when, when they first came, it took three buddies to take care of this individual and, you know, going through this and, and working on that and ignoring things and working on that. I can tell you after a couple of years of working on all that, we were able to back off to two and then back off to one. And guess what? He doesn't even require a buddy anymore. He's able to be in the classroom, do well on his own. He may have a bad day that he needs a little help, and so we can help him then. Um, but it's amazing how how much that can help um, with it. And once they learn routine and what's supposed to happen, routine is so important. So having that structure, and, and you're already doing that. So having that routine, having that structure where they know what's supposed to happen, that social story can be a big part with that too. So those are some important things to push. But no, it, it can get worse before it gets better. Um, but it, it, it's so hard. Every time you give in a little bit, you just go backwards. Other thoughts or questions? Can I ask a question? I have never heard the term social stories before. What is that? Yeah, Diane, you want to explain social stories? You're muted. It's, um, you uh, write a little story that um, tells a child what you want them to do. You don't use negatives. Um, oh, when I, when I go to Sunday school, I have fun. I have friends. 
I take turns with my friends. Sometimes I do not get a turn and that's okay. My friend gets a turn. I like Sunday school. Just something like that. You just real basic, not a whole lot of um, words on a page. Um, if possible, have pictures and pictures of the child. And then um, I've done video social stories also, like um, this is the bathroom and sometimes the toilet will flush and I didn't want it to flush, that's okay. And then you would, you just, it's real positive, but you just, um, however the child learns, if they would learn best from the book or they learn best with a video, you would just write a positive way to tell them how to, um, work through that situation. Yeah, and you can actually Google social stories. There are a ton of free social stories that are out there. There's some fabulous ones, for, for instance, wearing a face mask um, that are fantastic for helping them. Um, it, there, there are not as many for the church world, um, but they're starting to pop up um, there. But they, they can be real helpful, um, especially if you got someone who you just, you know, sometimes it helps them to be able to see what's going on and then hear it and you just kind of read through it. They don't have to be verbal to be able to do it. Um, if they are verbal, I like having them repeat back after I say it, then they would repeat it back to me. So, you know, they're following. And so you get that repetition. Um, but they work great as well when you do have a nonverbal child um, going through um, like they and said, I love having pictures with it. And if possible, I always take my own pictures instead of using, you know, like cartoons or things you can find. Because if you can take a picture of your own classroom, um, you know, your own, you know, worship area, whatever, that's going to help them understand it so much more than if you just have generic pictures. Does that help? Yes, it helps a lot. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Um, how are you, let me just throw out some other, other questions for you guys that we can discuss. Um, how are we doing recruiting volunteers coming back? Because what I'm hearing from a lot of people is my families are starting to come back, but my volunteers aren't ready to. Um, so, and, and we're, I'm hearing a lot of the volunteers aren't coming back yet are those who use a lot of youth for their volunteers, you know, so a lot of the, the teens, um, they've not been coming back mainly because the parents aren't wanting them back yet. Um, so how are you guys doing on volunteers and recruitment there? This is such a timely question because I would say this is the number one thing on my brain and on my heart and then on my team in general, especially as I was talking about, we're like, full-fledged launching campuses and can't backfill the ones that we're sending. And um, it's just been really fun, you know, and yeah. really exciting to see how God's working. And I feel like weekly I get a volunteer texting me, um, I can't serve anymore for this reason. My job changed this, um, but the Lord is so faithful. <laughs> he really is. And um but something that we've been talking about is like recruiting leaders over doers. And I think that's a really interesting concept. If you can get someone, as you were talking about, kind of like your, um, your virtual ministry director, like if you can get a high level leader or even um, start passing things on and, and asking more, I know I tend to say no for people or I am like, oh, they're just a volunteer. They work a full job. They don't want to do this. Like I have to stop myself from assuming that and start, um, I was reading today that like um, leaders are energized by more responsibility and new problems to solve. And that really, um, that is helping them walk in the calling that God has for them. And it's not a hindrance and it's not asking more of them. So I'm kind of walking that myself, but just building up those high level leaders, pouring into them um, and encouraging the team that way. And um, it's been, it's been tricky, but I will say as many of our old families and old volunteers that have said, no, they can't come anymore or they're not coming at this time. I've had just as many new families and new volunteers 
Um, so it's just kind of, it's just, I'm always surprised at how it all kind of shakes out. I don't have like the number one like answer how, how to do this, but it is something that I've been working on quite a bit. Yeah, so love that, uh, Quincy. And, and I've been where you're at. You know, I, I had to, you know, we, we've had to do a couple of campuses and, and you're exactly right, trying to get those launched and then back to, it's a hard, hard job. So um, I've been there um, with that and, and uh, totally can relate to you. Um, I, two, two things you said are, are gold there. One, never say no for volunteers. I had to teach myself that too. And, and we get in that mindset, they're too busy. I can't put that on them. Well, that's a wrong thing to say. Um, and then I, I started coming back to myself. I was a hundred percent volunteer and I was putting in 80 plus hours a week um, for them. Uh, so I was on staff as a full-time volunteer. Um, who am I to say a volunteer can't do more? I'm one. Um, so I'm like, okay, that's stupid. I'm, I'm contradicting myself. The second thing to remember, and, and I want you to remember this, you're absolutely, you're going to be looking for leaders, but your best leaders are when you are looking for the busy people. The, those who are the busiest are the best leaders. They always are. Why? They know how to lead. They know how to work through it. You don't want to ask someone who's not doing anything because they're usually not a real leader. A leader's going to be up doing things, and they're doing a lot of different things. So, you know, and I know Quincy's heard this, but especially for Isabel and Diane, let me share, you know, some of my pure gold when it comes to volunteer recruitment. Um, with things. And, and, you know, I've got the four most important letters in the alphabet when it comes to volunteer recruitment. It's I, C, and U. I, C, and U. And so let me tell you how this works. First off, your primary job on the weekends, it's not making sure everything's flowing well, make sure all the buddies are there, everyone's in the classrooms, everything's going well and putting out the fires, your number one job is observing everybody, everybody. And you're constantly looking to see who would be a great volunteer and who would be a good leader. And you're looking for characteristics and you know what you're wanting. So the way this works, and I'm going to use a little for an example, okay? I'm the ministry director and I've, I've observed Elizabeth the last couple of weeks. And so what I would do, I'd come up to Elizabeth and say, hey, Elizabeth, you have just a minute? Like, sure. I go, hey, you know what, Elizabeth? You know, I just want to let you know, you know, I love watching you, you know, serve and do, do things. And I just want to let you know, I, I see in you someone who just has some amazing characteristics and traits that would do amazing things in our disability ministry. I see in you someone who's patient and just has enormous love for the individuals around you. And what I would like you to do, I, I've got one question for you. We've only got one requirement to be able to serve in our ministry. Can you be a friend? Elizabeth, can you be a friend? And she just said, yes. I'm like, fantastic. Well, what I, that's the only requirement we have. You don't need to know anything else. We can train you on everything else. Train in. So nothing to be fearful about. You don't need any experience at all. What I want you to do, I'm going to ask you to take two weeks and pray and ask God to see if he wants you to serve in our ministry. Because I see in you someone who's going to make an impact for the kingdom in our disability ministry. Would you take two weeks and just pray? And then maybe we can get together for coffee in a couple of weeks and just talk through what that might look like. Okay, what happened there? Well, I did a shoulder tap, a personal shoulder tap. 
that's always the best way to recruit somebody. It's not announcing from the pulpit. It's not putting it in a bulletin. Um, those, I'm sorry, rarely ever work. If you get those people, they are not there. Did you hear me ask her, hey, why don't you give us a try? Give us four weeks and let's see how you like it. Please never use that terminology because what happens normally, the volunteer will give you four weeks and then they're gone, okay? Instead, I said, hey, I'm seeing these characteristics that are gonna line up great with our ministry. And then I helped them know, I only have one requirement, that's that you're a friend. We can all be a friend. So everyone always tells me, yeah, of course I can be a friend. I just remove the fear. I don't know anything. I don't have the experience. Don't worry about it. I'm going to teach you that. And then I pulled in the big gun. I pulled in God. And I'm not having to do the major lifting. God does. And I'll tell you, when I come back in two weeks and meet with them, guess what my success rate is? 90 to 95% success rate on having them join our ministry and volunteer with us. And I've never had it work any other way. Um, you know, if you ask them to give you just a try, they'll do that and they're gone. Now, here's the next thing I do. Once they come back, I've, I've learned a lot over the last several years. My next question after they say they want to be there, it used to be fantastic. What would you like to do? I never asked that because that is usually followed back by what's your greatest need? I loved that answer because I would always say what my greatest need was. And they're like, okay, just put me there because they thought they were helping you. Well, what happens if they're not passionate about what they're doing, even if God's pushing them to do it, they're only going to be there for a month, two months, maybe three, and then they're going to get burned out and go. So my first question now is, hey, Quincy, tell me what you're passionate about. What floats your boat? What excites you? And then I try to mirror those up. And guess what? It may not always be a buddy. Um, Perfect example, I had I had a, a lady that I was actually recruiting to be a buddy. I need desperately needed an adult lady, an adult woman to, to be a buddy. I thought I had the perfect one, did the whole ICNU. God convicted her and said, yes, I've got to do this. I'm ready. I go, what just absolutely floats your boat? And she said, you know what? The thing I get so excited about is encouraging people and writing thank yous. And I'm like, yeah, that can be a buddy, but that's not really the best use for a buddy. That's not doing that. And I'm sitting there and then God just kind of flicked me on the head and said, that is exactly what you need. You need someone who's going to do volunteer appreciation for you because your volunteers are working their rear end off. And I go, hey, would you ever care to maybe do a volunteer appreciation for us, coordinator, where maybe once a month you can put together a little package and write little thank yous to our volunteers? I would love that. Well, she did that for several months, and then she's like, you know what? I also want to buddy, and then jumped in. And we had her forever um, until she got married and they moved out of state. And then she, where she went, they, they started doing ministry. Um, together. So it's finding what they're passionate about and sticking them in because when you match passion with their volunteer role, that's when you get a volunteer that sticks. That is the goal. That is what wins and that's what grows your ministry. And when you can find someone who's got that leadership ability as well, oh, you really have it then. And then you, you challenge them, you give them things to do, and that's when your ministry can really grow. So real quick there on some of the volunteer recruitment that you can be doing on the weekend, even when you're like, what's going on right now? Um, but then as you're, you know, calling volunteers and, and getting to learn them, you know, 
see if you talk to them if, if there's things that you're learning about that um, you know granted you're you know and, and maybe you do do the talks via zoom or facetime or, or something um, make them a little more personal than just you know by the phone but find ways that you can try to get interactive with volunteers and and help them feel passionate um, because your job is to be the biggest cheerleader you can for your ministry. And you have to be extremely passionate and allow that to pour out of you and encourage your, your team um, with that. And when you're passionate and you're encouraging, they're gonna become passionate and encouraged. And guess what happens next? They're gonna start bringing in people. And that's when you can really see teams and ministries grow. Questions or thoughts on any of that or other aspects? Any other areas that trying to think through how can we do this or, or I'm just not sure I'm doing this right or what should we do? So once we open up our, um, our special needs departments in person, um, something that I have had a lot of concerns brought up about um, is the aspect of wearing masks and social distancing. Because I know special needs kids, it's going to be so much more difficult for them. Most special needs kids do not feel comfortable wearing masks. It makes them nervous. Um, it can set them off. It, um, yeah. So what suggestions do you have um, for us as ministry workers wanting to make our teachers feel safe, wanting to make uh, everybody around feel safe, but also um, that our kids feel welcome and it doesn't make them um, upset? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think um, a couple of things is we definitely, I don't know where, I know a couple churches have different stances on mass as just kind of a whole, um, but definitely highly encouraging um, and even requiring your volunteers to wear masks because that at least eliminates, you know, that segment of the population. Um, and then ultimately the individuals, you can encourage them, but you can't really require them to because they're just they're just not going to. Um, and so, um, and you can reward them for doing it, that sort of thing. But some of them, it's just not going to be a good fit. Um, and so, other things though is if you um, have individuals that are great at sitting at the table, just making sure that they're spaced out. Um, and also having max capacities in rooms. Um, those are some things that you can be really um, diligent about and you can control a little bit more. Um, and then, you know, just if you're passing out food, making sure that it's individual, that people are washing their hands, just those kind of safety um, protocols. And so ultimately just doing kind of everything that you can to be as safe as possible and being a little bit lenient with the individuals, if that answers your question or helps you. Yeah, um, I had my parents talk to my families about um, the wearing the mask, and I found some social stories on Pinterest about um, wearing masks. And um, we did the, all this in July, but I, I'm pretty sure I sent it digitally to my parents, and the kids are not required to wear a mask. We have signs of, around the church that says something about if they're age five or more, uh, five or older, we want them to wear a mask. However, we will not enforce or we will not. So it, no one, none of my kids wear a mask, even my almost 18 year old, but um, the volunteers do. But we started off, I encourage my parents to tell um, the kids that church is going to look different than when they were there last and that um our, a lot of our friends and our teachers will have masks on. And I said that social story. Yeah. Um, and also a lot of the school systems, you know, they're requiring masks. They're trying to figure out if they're in person, that's kind of what they're doing. And so um, the individuals are somewhat used to that from school. And so trying to mirror that is kind of 
that's generally a, a pretty easy way to figure out a way to adapt. Yeah, so I, I'm just been, I, I think it you know really depends on on your church. Every church is a little different with the policy that they have. So you got to see what your church says and does. Um, you know, I've talked with a couple of churches that are adamant. Everyone has a mask. And if they don't, they're not welcome. To. Um, and they didn't care if, if the child had special needs or not. Um, so that makes it pretty hard um, with it. And so one of the things that I, I kind of was working with them through and recommended is, well, do you maybe have an entrance that you can have just for the families with special needs that might be close to their classroom um, or something where maybe they're not with the whole rest of the church and kind of around everyone else. So you can encourage them just to go in there, you know, not enforce the mask, have them go right into the room and, and kind of decrease that. This church did have that. Um, and they're, I don't know what the latest is, but they're thinking through, praying through if that's what they do. Um, so they're at least willing to look at that and understanding. But, you know, a lot of times when churches are making these rules kind of across the board, they, they really aren't realizing the effect it has on families with disabilities. So that's where it's our job as the ministry director to be, you know, able to share and tell the families, hey, you know, this is what's going on, you, you know, uh, and let them know that and let them know how hard it is um, for the family. And, and so we've got to be the advocates for our family with staff, with senior leadership. And we've got to be the voice. And so, you know, there are going to be a lot of times that you're going to have to fight. Um, and you need to also then realize what are going to be hills that you are going to be willing to die on? And what are hills that you're like, okay, we'll just have to move on? Because there will be some. And, and I've had to make those decisions before in the past that, okay, I'm not going to, you know, worry about this battle right now. But there have been other battles. Oh, I'm I'm going to stand and fight until I get it because it was that important for our families. And it's just helping bring that teaching education. And that's our biggest role as directors is educating the staff, educating senior leadership, um, and educating every ministry on how to work together. So those are some of the other important things there. Um, you know, some other options, you know, some may not be willing to do the mask so you can try face shields. Um, some have been able to do that instead. Um, but, you know, like uh, Elizabeth said, so many schools right now, they're having to do it there. They're in like the said, there are a lot of great social stories. So we're actually finding a lot more of our individuals will do the mask or willing to try. Um, there are though going to be a handful who just can't do it. They, they can't handle that sensory. Um, on their face. And so those are the ones that we talk about and, and just try to, you know, find ways that we can work through it. But volunteers, I say, yes, you absolutely have to have them do it. Um, and then church, one of the other things that they're talking through, you know, do you do temperature checks on everyone? I know some churches are doing that, others are not. Um, or do you do temperature checks on the volunteers? So it's just trying to figure out what you, you're doing. Um, and for all of us, I'd say those are decisions that are going to fall more on, you know, senior leadership. They're going to be making those decisions for, for the entire church and, and the congregation. Uh, those are things you're probably not going to have to make a decision about, but you're going to have to fall in line um, with what they're doing there. Then. Um, but I think those, those are the things. Anyone else ideas when it comes to masks or, or not wearing them or trying to force them? Quincy, what do you guys do? Oh, I am not the best at enforcing the masks. I My experience is all my kids wear them with their families. And then I have like three individuals that popped into my mind when you're talking about this, who immediately take it off as soon as they get there. And it's just like a constant, like if I say, put your mask on, they comply. But then like three seconds later, it's off. And it's just like, I get tired of fighting that battle. So I think what Elizabeth said was good. I mean, what, where I find my comfort or security, whether it's correct or not, is that we do have a pretty small class limit and class size. And 
we try to spread the kids out as much as possible and avoid their close contact. Um, so if I can do those things, I feel a little bit better about it, but um, I haven't had anybody like have meltdowns about wearing it. Like I said, they'll comply if I'm on them. And if I had a, a volunteer that was really uncomfortable with a student not wearing a mask, I would probably be more adamant about encouraging that. Um, but that's been my experience. It's funny that you bring it up because like I immediately thought of some very specific situations I have at church. <laughs> Now, I will say, I, I am aware of a situation where a volunteer absolutely refuses to wear the mask. Um, and, and they said they will not wear it, no matter what. Well, you know, then my response then would be, I'm sorry, you're just not going to be able to serve with us for now. Um, maybe in the future. Yeah. I, I don't know when this is going to change. So I had some, so when we were making our calls, and asking if people were ready to come back. That was a question that was asked a lot. And if they did not want to wear a mask, I encouraged them to serve in another capacity from home. Right. Maybe that was writing postcards. Maybe that was. And that's exactly. That was kind of all I had at the moment, but it is required for all the adults and volunteers to wear masks. Right. And, and I love that, Quincy. That's exactly what we want to do, though. We don't want to send them on the way saying they can't serve at all. You know, we have to say you can't serve, you know, as a buddy, you can't be there in person. Um, but, you know, hey, we still want you. Maybe you can start doing this for us or, or that. Um, you know, maybe it could be you ask them, hey, would you like to do a volunteer appreciation coming up with little, little things? You know, we all need that, um, you know, because our, our volunteers do so much and, and, uh, they, they are forgotten a lot, you know, so it's important that we are constantly telling them thank you, but, um, you know, sometimes getting a little, you know, even just a, a little bag with uh, a graham cracker, or half of a Hershey bar and a marshmallow and putting a note on that says, we need more volunteers like you and put in a Ziploc bag. You know, it costs honestly a nickel to a dime to make. That's the some probably some of the best money you could spend on volunteers. They would appreciate that far more than you know gift cards and some of the other things. Because um, why someone actually took time to make it for them, um, and that means a lot. So. Okay, other questions we got. Uh, or any other concerns going on. Isabel, I will encourage you. I know Diane and Quincy's ministries are very strong and vibrant and um, you have a lot of experience on this call if you have any other questions. <laughs> I think also to encourage you like Rome wasn't built in a day and I have to remember, like I got handed a really strong ministry and I'm very grateful for that. But every campus that we launch, I have to remind myself like in my church day one that my church doors were open, there was not a thriving special needs ministry. Like that takes so much time and word of mouth and, um, you know, trust from your families. And it just takes a lot of time and um, be gracious with yourself in that. And um you're going to do a great job and it's it's really hard to start from the ground up or trying to start it back up again and um you're going to do a great job it, and here's the great news for you isabel you don't have to do it alone so you know we're all here to help you um you know one thing i definitely want to have happen you know over the next week or two i want to have a, a zoom call with elizabeth and i and you so we can specifically talk through your ministry and help you through things um, and see how you're doing. You know, literally Diane and uh, Elizabeth and I met yesterday and uh, for an hour or so talking through things and, and just how she can do X, Y, or Z and working through that. So that's why we're here. We love doing that. Um, so, you know, use us, use our resources um, for you and, and let us help you. Um, with that. There's so many different things that we can do for you, um, in, including training or whatever you need. Um, you know, Quin Quincy's church, they, they've got a special place in my heart because they were one of the first ones that I helped get launched. 
Um, and it's just really cool to see how, how they've grown and what they've done. Um, so, you know, that, that's been really cool to, to see that. And um, I think Quincy, you might, you're the third or fourth director now in, in, since it, it launched, um, just how God's moving everyone and doing different things. But, you know, even with that, you know, shortly after Quincy started, you know, I made sure we met and she knows we're here to help her um, with everything. So that's not going to change. Um, you know, that's that's who SOAR is and why we're here. So, um, And you've got a huge family. And that's why we do these meetings. So we can continue to talk and continue to learn from one another, another and move forward in everything that we're doing. Well, thank you so much for that. That means a lot. <laughs> um, I, from a very young age, knew that God called me to ministry. I wasn't sure in what capacity, uh, if that was in church, if that was overseas doing missions, um, or if it was something as simple as working as a teacher in school. Um, but when I was offered the, the possibility of even, uh, not auditioning, but interviewing for the the job, I was really excited, but also uh, weary of it just because of the special needs aspect. Um, because I have experience, but I don't feel that I am as capable as I want to be. <laughs> um, and so I know that God has given me those leadership skills that I need. Um, however, there's definitely room for growth. And so I'm excited to see what he's going to do um, and how I can help really change the lives of those people because I know that if if I trust in God um, that he can do anything so absolutely and, and you know so uh, uh, some some of the you just said there kind of reminds me of myself you know when I first started I kept saying I have no clue what I'm doing um and and even um you know I don't know if you guys know who Amy Fenton Lee is she wrote a book on doing disability ministry. It's been a while now, but she used to work with Orange and she actually brought me out to the Orange Conference and said, Doc, you're going to be speaking. And you do. I'm like, seriously, I don't know anything. I don't know who I am. You know, I, okay. And I did it. And, you know, the enemy does that to us. You know, the enemy keeps telling us we're not good enough. We don't know enough. And it took her speaking truth into me for me to finally hear it. And then I was at the conference and then it was after the conference, I had a line of like a hundred people. I was able to answer all their questions. I'm like, Oh my gosh, maybe I do know something. And, and now I'm, you know, I'm like, okay, yeah, I definitely know something. I understand something and God's preparing me for this. So, you know, God's preparing you for something mighty um, with that. So don't listen to, to that story, you know, that lie that you don't know what you're doing. Um, you're going to do just fine. Um, and you got, you know, we're ready to link arms with you and move forward and you're going to do awesome. Um, and, and just like you said, you're going to help, help all the individuals there you've got to see the love of Jesus and, and learn them. And, and I can't wait for you to uh, be able to, you know, have a prayer of salvation with, one of your individuals or, or have first baptism with one of your individuals in the church. Um, those are when it's really, really cool. And, and you realize just exactly what God has done for you and, and through you. So you can do it, girl. We know it. <laughs> um, I asked this about this time last year and I got some really good responses from the experts on the call. So we'll try it again. I have a um, sign language interpreter who's super passionate about a deaf ministry at our church and we have just not been able to get it off the ground. Um, but her passion is so strong and I want to support her. Um, but we're just kind of, I just feel like we hit a lot of hurdles. Um, so she came, She comes from a church in Washington State that had a really strong, thriving deaf ministry where she was on a team of like 10 or 12 interpreters, like pretty, wow. pretty big thing. And um, 
So she kind of, she knows how it all works, but I have no clue. And like, I keep, I keep asking and digging, like, what did that look like? And how did, and she doesn't know how it started. She just kind of jumped in on it. So anyways, she really wants to see that at our church. And I would love to see that at our church. I want to be an accessible church, but um, I don't know, just, I don't have any specific questions, just like any advice or any experience that anyone's come in contact with. We had two um, attendees who were deaf and utilized the interpreting during the service. One passed away and um, one is still attending our church, but is all virtual at the moment and is not needing an in-person interpreter. But we know as the pandemic fades, he will return in person. And that's, that's kind of what we're going with it, kind of maybe post-pandemic even, but um, what can we put in place now? I don't know. It's, it's a very vague question. <laughs> no, it, it's good. Um, anyone have any thoughts? What about um, Kansas State School of the Deaf that's uh, located in um, Olathe? Um, a- asking um, for other churches in that area or if they know any churches and maybe if they could connect you with another church that has a deaf ministry. And I know that people who are hearing impaired, that's a culture almost that, um, so if there's just one, I mean, um, it it would be different because that's why they have the school of the deaf because it's a culture, because of the language, it's just a different way of living. It's still great, but not still great. It's just a different way of living. But um, I'd probably start with the school for the death and see if they could hook you up somehow. I have a question for you, Quincy. Is the um, the volunteer someone that's fluent in sign language? Yes, she is certified ASL interpreter and she is actually even recruited two additional interpreters. I have no idea if they were going to our church previously wow. or if she just was like, determined to get the deaf ministry going and she recruited them and now they do attend our church so she is like recruiting a team of certified interpreters so Uh, go ahead essentially you just need individuals who are deaf that would utilize the interpreting service yeah because we had a call with her and talked about like scheduling and what that would look like and she's like i'll be there every sunday i promise and like she's like all on on board i just need to figure out how to make it happen. <laughs> yeah, so you, this is a great problem. So I've tried to launch a deaf ministry. Um, my problem was I could not find the interpreters. Um, you know, we didn't really have, you know, we had a couple individuals who were deaf. Um, I had a couple people who were interested in interpreting, but not fluent. Um, and I learned a lot through that process. I did talk with school to death. Um, and they honestly weren't a big help um, with it. Uh, what they could help me with was recommend people who we could use to help with interpreting, um, but I would have to pay them. Yeah. And here's the hard thing. It's $150 an hour. And usually you're know, talking three hours. And as your interpreter has done that, you can't have just one interpreter. They can, pr- they pretty much will only interpret in, at most 15 minutes at a time because their hands get tired. So they switch out. And the other thing I learned, there are interpret, especially if you try to interpret your worship, not all interpreters can interpret songs and worship. That's a whole special part too. So try to figure that out. But if you got an interpreter who wants to do this has actually building up a team, this is where I would then start having the conversation with your church leadership um, saying, look, we got this and and not necessarily worry about, well, who are we doing it for? Um, Because, you know, it it is a culture, but as you start doing it, I think that would start growing um, if people knew it. So, you know, there are many things that you can do, you know, Maybe right now, um, when they're live streaming everything, they could have have a little circle in the bottom corner 
signing with it. Well, guess what would happen with that? That would get the word out that you you got certain signing services. You'd probably have people that would start showing up um, for that. So it's just trying to do little things like that that might work and get it out. So I, I tried through that, um, you know, and then where you probably could work through uh, school of death is you know see if they can help connect you with possible families out in you know the Lee Summit area um, that you know may be looking for churches or that you might be able to reach out to. Um, you know I, I can put you in connection with um, uh, uh, the Buchholzes. Uh, they they run the uh, Deaf International Church here in Kansas City. Um, it's 100% deaf, um, and, and they do all the signing and everything. Uh, her and her husband are the pastors there, and they started the church um, and do a great, amazing job. They've got a son with special needs who's part of our, our ministry um, and, and do all kinds of things with them. Um, but she, I, I can put you in connection with her to kind of, you know, get some ideas, see if she can help you with with things. For me, my hardest thing was we didn't have a budget to get anything. Um, I had, you know, one, maybe two, but, you know, for us, we then had to have, I think they said for what we had, we had to have four or five because the two people I had couldn't do any of the worship um, and didn't know how to do that. And then the other thing I'd say, you don't have to, do, you know, because you guys have multiple services, you wouldn't have to do all the services. I would highlight, hey, we're going to do just, you know, the 11 o'clock service or whatever, and that be the one and, and, and that. So that's the other way to go through. And, and who knows, maybe it would grow where, you know, maybe in five years you are doing every single service and you've got a team of 10, 15, 20 um, interpreters um, yeah. with it. So, um, you know, those, those would be maybe some of the things I'm thinking of right now. Um, you've got the better problem uh, right now that you've got, you got the volunteers who are wanting to do it. Um, and so that that's a great, great problem to have. I also I know, love that they weren't going to your church before. <laughs> I don't know. I don't really know anything about these other two people. She's just like, I just have these two friends that are going to interpret as well. And I'm like, okay. She's like, they're awesome. certified. And I was like, sounds good. Cool. So. I know back in the day when I used to do more research, um, I don't remember the name of the study, but um, the retention for people who were hearing that did not need the signs was greater when there was someone doing sign language. I don't remember all the facts. Doc, do you, do you know what I'm talking about? I, I do. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but you're absolutely right. And I know for myself, especially when you see someone who will sign worship, Oh my gosh, I love that because it truly brings those signs, those songs to life in so much more meaning when you see it being signed. Um, it's really cool. Um, and the retention is so much higher for yeah. the hearing population. They will remember and even understand more, but I can't tell you the name of the study though. Yeah, I don't know. You know, the other thing I'd say, Quincy, ask this volunteer, what I would probably do, I'd ask this volunteer, um, if she's got any contacts to the church she was at, was it Washington? Um, and then maybe you call them up in Washington and say, hey, how did you get started? What did you do? We're looking to do that and try to go from there. So that's what I would do. I'd, I'd also try to find some churches who are doing it well and see how they started. You know, did you have many people when you started or what drove you to start it? Um, with that, because there are some churches that just have phenomenal ministries going on right now for the deaf, um, and so that would be cool. So I think that would be one of the other things I'd recommend is try to get in touch with that church or see if there are other churches around, and maybe you know uh, that can be something we're talking with um, the boot cults is uh, see if they know of other churches. Um, their church obviously is very unique; it's all deaf. Um, but you know, there are other, I'm, I'm sure there are other churches, um, in town. I, I think church of the resurrection has, um, some, some interpreters, um, there. So they might be another one you can try to contact. They're an extremely large church, but 
Um, I think I think they've got something too. All right. I have one other thing. Sorry, but if anyone else, no, okay. apologize. I just got an email today, actually, that was interesting to me, and it's um, and it just kind of got me thinking. Like, I don't really have a specific question for this either, but this individual has a uh, very mild autism and some bipolar, and mom was reaching out for some services. Not services. She's having trouble getting services. If he's like eighteen, so he's like out of school age, but not totally launched and he's brand new to the area. Um, there's just a lot of different things, but it just kind of got me thinking like, what can, I was like, I'm thinking in my head, like how sensitive is our church to those like super mild or invisible disabilities? And like, what yeah. what is the appropriate recommendation? She's coming to me asking for stuff. Like, well, what is my appropriate response? Like, I don't think it's the teens and adults class. Um, you know, so, and it's, it's our young adult ministry is she's already interested in that, but like, then you're going to need a heads up kind of about this individual. Um, yeah, I don't know that there's not a question attached to this. I was just thinking about those more mild. Uh, how old was this individual again? He's know? 18. 18. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, no, that, it's a great question and great, great thing there. Um, you know, in trying to find how you can welcome them in, I've had many with, you know, some mental health issues that, that we've had, and, and we've had them be part of our special needs ministry, um, and, and had, you know, buddies with them trying to help them if they need that. Um, it just kind of varies on, on who they are and, and what's going on um, with it. Um, uh, one of the first things I'd recommend for you is to touch base with key ministry. Um, key ministry is phenomenal with working with mental health. Uh, Dr. Steve Gersovich um, it is, is great. Um, uh, Catherine is, is there too and, and, and does a lot. So they can give you a lot of great resources and, and help them walk through that. Um, uh, another thing that you can do here locally, um, you can also reach out to uh, the local chapter for NAMI. Um, and I never remember what name it officially stands for, but it's like the National Association of Mental, basically mental health. But uh, and uh, they they sometimes what can actually do some trainings and education for you um, and help you, and they they're very keen on trying to help get everyone included everywhere, and so. They may be able to give you some resources to help you through that, um, try to figure out. Um, and then I, I would talk with mom and, and just see, um, okay, what are things really like? You know, um, yeah, you know, bipolar, but is, is the autism more of an issue or is the bipolar more of an issue? Um, my gut would say probably is the autism is the bigger part of the issue there because the bipolar very hopefully would be well controlled with medication uh, with that. Um, and then if it is, well, then you're, you're just dealing with uh, trying to deal with the autism and, and teach and work with that. But it's knowing the importance with the bipolar and being able to welcome them still and work through that. Um, but I, I would definitely say, you know, having, having key ministry help you through that. Um, as far as finding resources, available uh, to them. Uh, since they're on the Missouri side, they need to reach out to Missouri uh, family to family. Um, and uh, especially there is uh, Georgia Mueller. She works there. Um, she's a part of our team as well. Um, but she is a wealth of information and would love helping get them connected and to where they need and, and know where to go for whatever services but she can definitely help them out with that but missouri family to family what was her name again georgia mueller m m u e l l e r and i can send you her email and contact information okay i really appreciate that yeah i think you're entirely right that the your teens and adults class wouldn't really necessarily be the best fit um because they're more profound individuals in there. And 
that probably would just kind of exacerbate any issues and just make him feel a little bit more unwelcome um, probably than anything. Um, so I think also just having really um, intentional conversations with mom of like, what do you want um, you know, your son's church experience to look like and kind of figuring out a plan together. Um, because also being 18, Wednesday night students, he's kind of outgrowing that. Uh, and so that may also not be the best fit. So, yeah. Yeah, no, I'll definitely call mom. She sent like a really long email that actually got forwarded on to me from our family pastor. Um, and thankfully our church has a Tuesday night young adult ministry that's gonna be a really good fit as long as that works for them. Um, but yeah, just, just kind of my brain, like how, how welcoming is our church to these kinds of situations? That happened in our church about six weeks ago. And I just uh, contacted our young adult ministry and told them I had a person with high functioning autism and that had a little bit trouble walking, but um, just had to walk slow, but um, he was fine. And if um, there was someone who, uh, they, they found a buddy for this person, um, I found out a little bit about his interest and they found someone to connect with him. And so I, I haven't followed up on that, but I probably should, but um, they, they did all the connections. Um, I just gave it over to them and they were very welcoming and yay. And so it was good in our, but I haven't followed up. So. Also just and thinking about the autism side of things. I know, um, you know, maybe some of your volunteers too that are in your ministry that just happen to attend the young adults just kind of saying, hey, just so you know, there's this new person coming. Here's his name. Like if you happen to see him, make sure to make him feel extra welcome and maybe even introduce him before just so he's a little bit more comfortable going. And I, I just looked up because it's driving me crazy. I can't remember. NAMI stands for National Alliance of Mental Illness. I'll try to make sure I remember that. So it's NAMI.org. Um, for key ministry, it's keyministry.org. Um, and they're fantastic. Um, so uh, the, they would love to help you out. And they've got all kinds of resources. All right. Any other questions or thoughts? a good night. A lot of good talk. A couple things I want to make sure everyone knows about, um, you know, for it, and, and you can think if you have other questions while we're going through things. Um, one, tomorrow I, I'm doing a talk with Doc. Um, it's a, a webinar we host uh, uh, on Fridays. It's from noon to 1 p.m. Central Time, um, and you can sign up for it uh, on our web page or on our Facebook page, but it's going to be a great talk, um, especially for us. It's on how to use social media to grow your ministry, um, and so we're going to be talking about that and going through that, and so a uh, great one to learn. I've got Jocelyn Ramos Campbell, who is a, a disability ministry leader and speaker from Florida, from the Orlando area, um, and has just done amazing jobs with, with her uh, ministry using social media. So uh, excited to be tapping into that. So if you can be a part of that, great. If you can't, we record all of them and put them up on our YouTube page. So make sure you then go check out our YouTube page. Um, I'd encourage you to subscribe to it. That way you can see immediately whenever something new comes out on a, our YouTube page is Soar Special Needs. Uh, just go there for that. Um, other things we also want to, you know, help you out. Um, you know, maybe, you know, you're sitting there, you're just trying to get back in person. You know, you may be saying, hey, we want to do this or that. We just can't do them yet, especially like respites. Um, well, we do a monthly respite that we would love to invite all of you and in your churches to. Uh, we break them out, and actually, let me just have, you know, Laura, why don't you tell about the, the respites? Your, that's your baby. 
Yeah, we're doing uh, monthly virtual respites at the moment. And so each month has a theme. We recently just did Disney, um, Christmas before that. Safari is our upcoming one. Um, a lot of the activities relate to the theme, not always all of them. Depends on the theme for the time. And we just play a variety of fun games from like, would you rather to zoomed in? Um, so like you zoom in on a picture and like pull it out to anything I can just find that kind of fits the theme. So like roller coaster rides um, that we found like YouTube videos of, um, a craft time, and then also a devotional. We make sure we do a devotional every time and some questions with it. Um, and they're an hour long and we have our elementary one on the fourth, yeah, the fourth Tuesday at seven o'clock central time. Um, and then we do a teen one on the second Tuesday at seven o'clock central time and an adult one on the second Thursday, also at seven central and they're all an hour. And um, if you go to our website, sourcespecialneeds.org or our Facebook page, you can find them posted with the sign up links. The participants do have to register ahead of time, but they can register two minutes ahead of time. That'd be fine. Um, just to our Zoom link, so that way we're controlling who is coming in and out of the Zoom. But they're totally free. Use them. The more the merrier. It makes them more fun if there's more people. So, yeah. It's especially a great option for um, those that haven't been able to come back to church yet for any reason. So. Mm -hmm. and, and right now, we, we honestly have individuals from all over the country joining. Um, so it's easy if you want to invite you know, your church group, your ministry to be a part of that. Um, we'll do all the heavy lifting for you. You don't have to do anything. Um, it's free. Um, and then if you'd like to pop in and be there with your, your folks, you're welcome to do that. Or if you want your volunteers to, to be there, or they'd like to be a part of that. They can do that. Don't have to, um, but we, we would love to have them there. Um, the second thing that we want to do to help everyone out, and sorry, something's in my eye driving me crazy, um, but the other thing we want to do is we are creating a, a virtual disability ministry directory where on our website we are going to host um, for free uh, for you a ministry virtual directory where you can do a 5, 10, minute video of your ministry, everything that you have to offer, and then we'll host it. We're waiting till we get about 25 before we launch it, but then it'll be searchable by city and state. What's going to be cool with it, families will be able to see what you do, and you'll probably be able to grow your ministry through that, but more important, volunteers will see what you do, and they'll want to come to you, um, and then we can learn from one another, see what you know, see what a ministry might look like in California. See what a ministry looks like in, in a small church that only has 100 people total, but they have 25 individuals with disabilities. Um, see what church looks like, disability ministry looks like in a 150-year-old church. Um, see what it looks like in a church 30,000 members out at Saddleback out in California. Um, so you can see all these different ones and learn different things that we can move forward with. But that we want to offer to all of you, if you're interested in doing that, um, you just have to build it yourself, do a video, however you'd like, and then let us know and we will get it taken care of where we can uh, get everything and, and put it up on the site and create that for you. So we'd love to be able to promote you and help you out. So that with, with that, sessions yeah, go ahead. the conference. Yeah, yeah. watching how everyone else does things. Yeah, so it, it's just just like that, we'll be doing it. So, um, and, and we'll be using those. Those from the conference were the first seven that we'll have, so yeah. All right, so with that, anyone else have any other questions or thoughts or anything we wanna go over? We've got a few minutes here left. We wanna make sure we watch our time and be mindful of that. Appreciate all of you giving up your evening with us here. All right. Well, I don't think you might mind if we end a little bit early, give you your evening back to you. Um, our next one, I want to make sure I tell you the right date. 
um, will be February the 25th for our next um, network meeting. And that one will be during the day. It'll be 12.30 to 2.30 that Thursday. Um, we'll do it virtually again, just like this. Um, but we'd love to have you join us. We'll be sending out information again. Um, also, if you haven't, we have a Facebook page um, that you can go and, and get on. Um, KC Special Needs Ministry Network, excuse me, um, and somewhere where you can post any questions you might have or anything. And then we will have other people who can jump in and answer those questions for you too. Um, so just another thing that you can do um, if you want to get hold of people. So, all right. Anyone have anything else before we end for the night? All right, Elizabeth, can I ask you to just close us out in prayer? Sure. Um, dear God, thank you so much um, for this time that we were able uh, to gather and talk about special needs ministry. Thank you for uh, these incredible ministry leaders and the churches that they represent and just the inclusion that's happening there. Um, God, I just uh, pray that you would continue to be with them as they um, steward their volunteers and their families and um, give them guidance and um, show them just how to um, reach all the individuals that they can and meet the needs that they have um, and provide all the resources um, that they need. Um, Lord, I pray that you uh, would just cover them in um, protection from all of the um, the craziness of the pandemic and just continue to help them um, navigate that as ministry leaders. Um, and we just ask that um, they would continue to make your name known um, to all the families uh, that they have and all the volunteers that they have. And we just ask this all in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys, appreciate you coming out. Um, and again, we're always here for you. Isabel, please reach out to us. Let's let's find a time to, to meet with you um, and, and help you get going. I'm proud of you, proud of all of you. And uh, continue um, sharing Jesus with, with our individuals and keep making a difference. You are kingdom impactors and never forget that. All right. Y'all have a blessed night. We'll see you later. Bye.